Diane. I mentioned before that I had worked with Diane. Uh, she actually lives in Massachusetts now, where she's close to her grandchildren, but she's worked in Vermont. She's worked in other states from, from preschool to teaching in middle school to working with adults and has a wealth of knowledge on not only the, the research, but the meaning and strategies of working with high trauma students. Uh, like I said, this is work that was kind of on my desk when I came in. Uh, it's work that's going on in the district, but I think we want to take a more systemic look at some of the practices, and, and this is just a very small snapshot. So we'll be looking for, as we're working on some plans, we'll be looking for feedback on ways and, and strategies and help that you think would be helpful and be useful for the classroom. So I'll turn it over to Diane. Thank you. I said to the other group, one of the things that's nice for me having um, kind of dropped the district and not worked with you all before not been in your classrooms was the snapshot that I got this morning. Remember when this up higher? classroom I got, um, a snapshot I got this morning from the stories that were told. And when I think about trauma-informed practices, I think a lot of them are manifested in those stories. Um, the willingness to be creative flights. The willing to, willingness to be vulnerable, to lean on each other, um, to applaud one another's successes. All of those are the things that help us to be trauma-informed practitioners. My job today, and I will apologize, I'll be skipping some slides, but my job today really is um, to look at the science, some of the science behind stress and trauma, and what that means for us in interpreting, particularly, our students' behaviors when they're having a difficult time. We can also talk about the science and what that means for instruction, but, and we certainly know instruction is tied in with behaviors, but we're going to focus a bit more on kind of behavioral manifestations that we see as a result of kids who have grown up experiencing childhood trauma. So, as any time I talk about trauma, I do invite you that if you feel dysregulated by any of this conversation, whether it's your own um, stress and trauma history, whether it's kids that you care about, it, whether it's just how you are today, if you need to regulate, if you need to step away and find a moment of calm and focus, please feel free to do that. Um, we will not have the time because we've abbreviated the session. Um, we won't have as much time to turn and talk, but I will give you a few opportunities to um, share a couple words with folks around you so we won't have to just sit and listen to me all the time. And there are handouts. Um, there are, uh, I think Shadow made a great number of them, but not enough for everybody. If you're a real visual learner and you want to have it, there are probably some floating around there. Um, you can also access them, access them through the scheduler. So I, my job is to kind of put a point in so that the district has some common language. I know there's a wealth of knowledge, and I can tell from the stories a wealth of skill and wisdom in this, in this district around how to support kids and how to take care of ourselves as well. But my job is to kind of put a pin in some common language around trauma and its definitions and then also in the science, that, in a, particularly the neuroscience, that is most educationally relevant. And then also talk about some key psychological things. And I'm only going to scratch the surface. I'm going to really focus on trust when we talk about the psychology that is related to stress and trauma. My hope is that even in this brief 45 minutes, that you will walk away feeling incredibly affirmed with the work that you do and how you, how you um, practice your profession for kids. I also hope that maybe something will trigger a, oh yeah, maybe I need to unpack that, I used to do it, I should pull it out again. And um, certainly I hope to stir some new thoughts and places where you might consider growing. I'm not going to have a lot of time for strategies. I will try to wind in a few strategies just because I, I never like to go to any session that doesn't give me some strategies. And it's purely philosophy, so I'll wind in some strategies, hopefully, as well. The contents of, you know, where I get my stuff from. I have pulled from the work of neuroscientists, physicians, Dr. Bessel van der Dr. Perry, Dr. Nathan Burke Harris, a huge number of folks, those are just a few, as well as psychologists, including James Garbarino, social workers, um, 
and other folks as well as educators. So my life, I, my, my thing where I um, did most of my teaching was as a middle school emotional support teacher. Um, so behavior's always kind of in my jam. Um, I have always been very drawn to kids that seem to need something different. Um, and I think what I've seen over my many years of career is that there are more of those kids and we are better and better all the time at not just doing things for those kids, but taking a universal approach that makes a difference for all kids and circles those kids in, in the process. So a lot of my work has been really informed through um, work listening to people like you and I don't know you. I know many of your colleagues across the country and um, they've brought so much wealth of um, information and knowledge and strategy gifts to me. So I will, this is a point for you to turn. When you get for a child, what jumps in your mind? I'm not gonna ask you to share out. Um, I don't think I'm people in front of the right ever. Um, and um, I can't actually know people at all. But turn to your neighbors. I'm not going to ask you to share it out, but just turn to your neighbor. When you hear the word trauma, what are some images or a couple words that come to mind? Quick share. Go ahead. Situation um, or severe neglect situation. 
I think about, and it's Veterans Day, I think about kids who are dealing with deployed parents. I think about kids whose parents um, have significant mental health issues and they are doing the level best they can. And I also think about kids who have um, uh, socioeconomic disadvantages and their families may be absolutely working so hard to create stability, but they can't. And so those all play into the development of a brain that functions a little differently and may need a little more scaffolding and support in order to do its best. So we can think about trauma in terms of a series of events or right, an event, and we can think about it also as kind of an ongoing, pervasive situation. I found for children that many times it's an event becomes that more pervasive situation. So we may have a fire in the home, or my family may split up, and that begins sort of a cascading effect. Um, now I don't know where I'm going to go. Now I don't have the bureau I used to put my things on, so I'm less organized with my materials. Now I don't know, um, I now have to work because financially we're in a much tougher situation. So what we often see that starts an event for kids is it becomes this more pervasive situation. And practitioners in the field will often talk about this trauma by a thousand needles. It's not any big thing, but it's that little drip, 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 cool stab, stab, tab of not knowing, for example, am I gonna be warm enough to sleep? Am I going to um, know who's gonna be in my household? Am I going to um, have clothes that fit me so I can sit comfortably? All of those sorts of things. There are so many potential sources of trauma, and I realize at the end of the slide in this setting, it's really hard to read, so I apologize for that. Um, so many potential sources, and this is far from inclusive. Anytime anything impacts our sense of emotional and or physical safety, it has the potential to be a traumatizing effect. Um, let's skip that. So why is trauma and childhood, the child development and, and childhood trauma so significant? Dr. Bessel van der Kolk actually has been petitioning um, to have childhood trauma listed very separately from PTSD and adults experience. And these are the reasons why. And even if you have a 17-year-old, that childhood trauma may be playing out for these reasons. And so childhood trauma is different because we have, um, we, we have children whose brains are developing. And they're developing the whole time that they're kids, but there's some critical developmental points that are much more fragile. And so we often think about um, toddlers and 18-month-olds as having very fragile periods. But six-year-olds are actually, um, it's another one of brain time. And for those of you that are middle school folk, the whole time kids are with you, their brain is in a rapid development. And the thing is, when they start tripping over their own feet, which, you know, their, their bodies are developing, they're out of sync. When their bodies are out of sync, their brain is out of sync. When their brain is out of sync, it's more vulnerable to the traumas that it experiences. Our brain continues to develop and grow. Anyone know how long it has significant, it, it grows throughout our life experiences. But the last big developmental phase is, anyone? Yep, about 25. And so um, that is when the prefrontal cortex is really fully wired in during our mid-20s. And so that's been really interesting information for those folks who have been studying longitudinally, the successes of school interventions. Because what they found is school interventions that happen when they assess kids at 18 look like they haven't been really valuable. But when they do longitudinally and further out, post that 25 years, these interventions have re resulted in much greater effects. So very interesting. And now we understand more how the brain develops and how long it makes significant shifts. So, trauma that happens when the brain is developing is going to be more destabilizing. Think of it as a house that has already undergone an earthquake and now there, there's a big aftershock. It's also because in childhood, and we'll consider childhood the whole time they're here with you all, childhood is when we decide how we attach and trust people. 
And so trust is our first um, kind of goal of social interactions. And if we can't trust folks, that's going to affect how we move in the world. And finally, we're in the point that we, you know, even if I'm a 17 year old or a 16 year old or a 12 year old, my history is going to be smaller than adult history. So events grew larger. That breakup with my boyfriend is going to feel like I will never have a relationship ever, ever, ever again in the rest of my life. Everything looms bigger because it lives in a smaller history. As adults, we have broader histories. So we can context things, we can frame things. We have other experiences with which to interpret um, the experience that is painful. It's also highly individualized beyond when it happens to us. So we, you know, it does have to do with the age we are in which we experience the high stress period. So I think about um, how, what it must be like for kids who have, and I don't know how, some districts have been incredibly unstable in terms of kids in and out and all the different changes over the past two and a half years. Um, those kids only know what they know. And it's really changed how they function. So many um, folks that I've talked to, this is a, a group of educators in Virginia that I asked them to, to name the, how many years behind they think most of their kids are. Like how are their juniors functioning? And they say, freshmen. They're like freshmen. And so we know that when those stressors happen, it's going to affect you because it's happening at a point in time with your previous experience. It's happening where you are developmentally. It has to do with where you are temperamentally. You know those kids that have just rocked and rolled through all the changes, and other kids that just it just didn't happen. Um, so it's very highly individualized. I do um, mentoring for kids that are first in family going to college, and so I've seen how their role in the family affects how their stress has played out, their trauma has played out in their life, and how they function. I'm going to ask you to talk about something pleasant. We're talking about trauma, which is heavy, but I'd like you to think, and you can share with someone around you, or do your own kind of quiet thinking, um, of a smell that transports you across time and space. It takes you somewhere else, or to be in the company of somebody else. A very pleasant smell. So think about something, and I'll ask for a few to share out, if you will. You can talk with each other and things on your own. Mowing with their father, or you know, being in the 
rice factor, different, you know, different things. But the gasoline and lavender was actually smells of their two grandparents. You know, so those are visceral. And so what does this have to do with trauma? Those are positive visceral experiences. When you smell those things, you're not using your thinking brain to say, I'm thinking about my grandmother right now. I want, you know, you, you see and smell those candies, your, your grandmother just pops into your head, right? Um, that's not a conscious decision to think about that. Trauma is a negative visceral experience. Things will wave into your head, and this is what we then call trauma triggers, without any intention. The other thing is trauma is non-sequential. We'll talk a little more about that um, in a bit. So when we think about trauma, it lives in the emotional part of the brain, and therefore it's kind of known in the bone. Yet it's not a conscious thing. As kids get older, they will often, when they trust you, so as you as kids are growing up through the system and they develop trust, they may try to describe their stress and trauma to you. And they may, they may give you what psychologists will call the cover story. It's not that they're trying to cover it up. It's the only language they can, they can bring to it. Because trauma is not a linguistic experience. We cannot capture it with language. But they will try as a communication method to use it. But what that often then will stop us short and we'll try to deal with that, just that piece that they're giving us. But we want to recognize that trauma is just a little bit of the surface. Even what kids are telling us about is not wholly capturing what it is to have experienced that trauma. That most of it lives below the surface. And that requires of us to ask really different kinds of questions. I love this quote. For every problem there's a solution that is clear, simple, and wrong. <laughs> We, we may need to ask really different kinds of questions, and when we are dealing with a child who's not reacting or not interacting in a way that we understand, asking kind of, could it be questions? You know, could it be this? And one of the places we can go that ask that are sort of those novel questions are rooted in the science. Could it be this is going on in their body and brain, and what can I do about it? And so, we, we often think about trauma as something that's addressed through therapeutic in terms of talk, talk therapy, cognitive approaches, psychological approaches. We aren't therapists unless you happen to be a therapist as well in your role here as an educator or outside of your role here. But we're, we can stay in our lane of being educators and be therapeutic as in creating change. Um, and many of those therapeutic changes happen in practices that are common practices for how we relate to kids and how we teach. And so we're going to kind of make those connections as we talk about the science. These are some of the manifestations. Um, we are both familiar with that. We don't have time. I'm going to just let you peek at that and we'll not be able to talk about those in depth when we come. I want to discuss the out of the blue reactions. So we know that there's some kids that have trauma triggers. We will say something or think about a student that was brought in to assess. Um, and I'm observing and trying to be casual. I'm observing all the kids in the classroom and trying to not look like I'm writing anything down about this particular student. But at this point in the lesson, um, they were kind of in a whole new stuff. At this point in the lesson, they were talking about genetics. And all of a sudden, this kid's desk went. And it was just gone. And what did the teacher said? Said, think about something that is a trait that resembles your parent. Gone, 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 gone. Um, you don't want to walk on eggshells all the time, but being aware and culturally making some shifts about how we talk about families, etc., and how we talk about things like genetics um, make a big difference for not triggering kids. But most kids. Most of the behaviors or the challenges we see or the disconnection. So I don't want to just talk about outward and kind of externalizing kinds of behaviors, but internalizing those kids that fall asleep, those kids that withdraw, and that are very um, reticent to interact with you. For all of them, um, it may be this effect that they're getting, and, and I had trouble doing this with the mic, so um, bear with me. But all of us come into any situation, whether it's a certain classroom or our day, 
at a certain set point, or this is our entry point. And we have some space, hopefully, um, that we can function before we get to our no longer the rational human being we hope to be, um, our flip out point. And during the course of our day, the stressors rise, right? And we get closer, but hopefully also there are interventions or things that happen that pull us away from that stress point. So we never really flip out. Many of our kids, what we see is their stressors are so high, and their stressors are living in a system that already has been changed by trauma, and they're coming in here. The problem is, this space, whether it's that big or this big, is a space in which we learn and interact. And the smaller it is, the less space we have to function successfully. So a lot of what we talk about in terms of what makes a difference in our classrooms, strategically, aren't big deal things that pull a kid all the way from here to here. It's little things that allow kids to kind of settle and settle. So we're going to do a little thing right now. We're going to do a a trauma-informed strategy you've probably never done before in your life, but get ready. Turn to someone near you and smile at them. And if you're going to ask, you can smile with your eyes. Problems 
with both of those regions of our brain. Where do our adolescents brains light up when faced with a problem? Big time the emotional. Just a bit in the cognitive. Now, a child with development, with developmental trauma, that's going to shift even more so. So it requires us to be really good at um, providing supports because we're dealing with a super, super emotional brain. Um, I'm not going to have time to talk about the strategies, but they are there. You know, we'll resource them in if you have a question about any of them. And we're going to loop back and do more with this. This is kind of the manager of, of, um, of what's going on physiologically. But safety is a good thing. How do you create safety? And one of the things we can do that um, is so simple is having kids have a landing spot when they come in our classroom. So assigned seats which feels constricting, and I'm used to not assign seats because I think kids have choice, which I think choice is good for kids, but from an emotional security standpoint, being able to know where you're going and not have to deal with the social ramifications of making that decision. You know, and I say, oh, yeah, so people go, yeah, I'm going to forever. Um, yes, yes. When we, are, when we are, have a, a traumatized brain, and this is true when we're stressed, our vision centers become more active, and our hearing centers again all, go offline and become very inactive. So we see more and we hear less, which means we know if we've got to stress out a kid, we've got to stop talking. They're not processing it because their cognitive brain is shutting down, portion is, is shutting down, and they're not even literally not hearing it. If you've ever been super stressed and you feel like you're in a tunnel, a wind tunnel, or you hear that word, that's your auditory center. Our vision centers become more active, and we actually read this. You hear teachers say, I saw it in her eyes when she walked in. What were we saying? What was the message? It may not have done anything. But what happens is when we're stressed, our eyes dilate more. And we often, at a real primitive level, do that in kids. And so they dilate more to taking more information, but they take the information differentially. So UC Berkeley researchers, found that the more stressed a person is, the less they pay attention to facial expressions than body language. And I think about how much I tried to control my facial expressions when I was dealing with difficult situations, and probably my body was given it away the other way, and I was incongruent. So really working on our body language, really thinking about when my vision center is more active, every movement seems faster, it seems more forward, People's size matters. Like if I come in, if I come in full front versus coming in kind of low and to the side, um, they're going to read that totally differently. Body language becomes kind of the big thing I came into. So I want to really think about that a lot. Um, the hippocampus, which is our working memory, it also contra concretizes facts. It's what we use when we try to cold memorize. It's also the part of our brain that it's responsible for remembering neutral and positive memories. Our original brain remembers negative memories. There's a whole bunch of stuff we can talk about in the future about sleep and how 